Today I'm heading out to explore a piece of forgotten Cold War history. A top secret location hidden in the hills just west of Baltimore City known as Nike Missile Site BA-79. Now these Nike Missile Sites were the first line of defense against Soviet bombers during the Cold War. But before we get there, I gotta make a pit stop at Royal Farms to fuel up for this road trip and grab some refreshments. Before we start, I want to thank Royal Farms for keeping me fueled up and refreshed during these road trips. So what exactly is a Nike missile system? The Nike missile systems were part of a Cold War air air defense program comprised of multiple sites deployed by the United States Army from the 1950s to the 1970s. The Nike missile sites consisted of a radar installation, underground missile storage and launch facilities, and command centers. These sites were typically located in rings around major cities and strategic locations to protect them from potential Soviet bomber attacks. At its peak in the late 1950s and early 1960s, there were approximately 265 Nike missile sites across the continental United States. All right, we're here. All right, so here we are at Nike Missile Site BA-79, one of the many sites that formed a protective ring around Baltimore and Washington, D.C. The system of Nike sites around Baltimore was called the Washington-Baltimore Defense Area and was made up of 19 different sites. The site naming convention worked like this. The first letter or letters stood for the city, county, or location the site was assigned to defend, so BA for Baltimore and W for Washington on this map. Next, the numbers represented the site's location in relation to the area it was protecting. Think about a clock face with 12 being 100 and 6 being 50. On this map, look at site BA-92 and W-93. They are almost directly above the cities of Baltimore and Washington. Now look at W-25 and BA-30-31. They are east of both cities. This site, like many others, was strategically placed to defend against potential Soviet bomber attacks. It was operational from 1954 to 1974, standing guard for two decades during some of the tensest years of the Cold War. As the Cold War intensified in the 1950s, the United States found itself in an unprecedented position. For the first time in its history, America faced a real threat of attack on its own soil. The Soviet Union had developed long-range bombers capable of delivering nuclear payloads to U.S. cities. These Nike sites, named after the Greek goddess of victory, formed a last line of defense against potential Soviet air raids. Nike missiles stood ready to intercept enemy aircraft before they could reach their targets. The imposing presence of these sites served as a constant reminder of the tense standoff between the world's superpowers. Each Nike installation was a testament to America's technological prowess and its determination to protect its citizens. The missiles, first the Ajax and later the more powerful Hercules, were marvels of engineering for their time. However, they also embodied the fear and paranoia that permeated American society during this era. As we explore the remnants of Nike missile site BA-79, we're looking at more than just military history. This is a physical manifestation of a time when the threat of nuclear war loomed over every aspect of American life shaping policy, culture, and the very landscape of the nation. Each Nike missile site was broken up into two sections, the Integrated Fire Control Area, or IFC, and the Launch Area. The IFC was the brains of the operation. This is where the radar and computer systems were housed, allowing operators to detect incoming threats and guide missiles to their targets. BA-79's IFC sat roughly three quarters of a mile south of its launch area and was demolished many years ago. One of the last remaining items from BA-79's IFC is this radar system that was moved to the launch area. The second section, and the heart of the Nike missile site, was the launch area. Here, concrete pads stood ready, each capable of sending a Nike missile skywards at a moment's notice. Beneath these pads, underground magazines housed additional missiles, poised for rapid deployment via elevator system. The nerve of the operation was an underground control center, where personnel coordinated launch activities. Nearby, several crucial structures supported the site's mission, a warhead assembly building for preparing the missile's destructive payload, a missile assembly building where the rockets were maintained and prepared, and a dedicated fueling area for the volatile propellants. This is the section we'll be exploring today. These concrete structures you see here are the missile magazines. They were designed to house the Nike missiles on the ground, protecting them from the elements and potential attacks. One of the most interesting aspects of the Nike system was its rapid evolution. 
The original Nike MIM-3 Ajax missiles were manufactured by Bell Labs and Douglas Aircraft Company. They were 32 feet in length and carried three conventional warheads. The Ajax missiles had a maximum speed of Mach 2.25 and a 30 mile range. As the Soviet threat grew, they were replaced by the more advanced Nike MIM-14 Hercules missile. The Hercules missile was manufactured by Western Electric, Bell Labs, and Douglas Aircraft Company. They measured 41 feet in length and carried the W-7 and later W-31 nuclear warheads. These nuclear warheads could be swapped out for conventional warheads. The Hercules had a maximum speed of Mach 4 and a range of 90 miles. Now it's time for us to explore Nike missile site BA-79. But before we do, make sure you like this video and subscribe to my channel. Our first stop is the Warhead Assembly Building. This hoist was used to move the conventional and nuclear warheads. Next, we'll check out the launch pads before we head down to the missile magazines. Here is one of the launch pads. The missiles and their launchers would have been positioned so they aimed north to fire incoming Soviet bombers that would have flown over the Arctic Circle towards America. Notice the iron plates situated on the ground next to the launch pad. These are the mounting points for the launchers. Cables would have run from the control room below to the launchers above through these tubes scattered around the launch pad. These are the magazine's air vents. This is the escape hatch for the magazine. In case of an emergency, soldiers could scramble off this ladder to get to safety. And this is the control room's escape hatch. Here is the magazine's elevator in the down position with the doors closed. And here is the magazine's elevator in the up position with the doors folded down, which we will see from below shortly. There would have been a launcher attached to the floor of this elevator. When a potential threat was identified, missiles were loaded onto the elevator from the lower floor of the magazine and then lifted to the surface. Once the missiles reach the surface, they are pushed over on a rail system to a waiting launcher. The final missile loaded onto the elevator would be fired right from the integrated launcher on the elevator. Before we go below ground and explore the magazines and control rooms at Nike site BA-79, let's talk about its life after the Cold War. This site was closed down in 1974 after Soviet intercontinental ballistic missiles became a new threat. It was eventually turned over to the state of Maryland. During that time, BA-79 fell into disrepair and needed some major TLC. A few years ago, the Maryland Wing headquarters of the Civil Air Patrol, which I was actually a cadet in during high school many, many years ago, leased the property from the state. In 2018, retired Chief Master Sergeant Tom Reed spearheaded the restoration efforts of the site. He, along with a team of volunteers, cleared the overgrown vegetation and repainted the above ground structures. All six of the magazines had flooded over the years and needed to be pumped dry. Each magazine took over a week to empty all the water that had pulled inside. Now it's time to go below ground and check out BA-79's magazines and control room. When Chief Master Sergeant Reed started the restoration work on site BA-79, this stairwell and magazine were flooded. You can see how high the water was by looking at the water line on the electrical box across the room. This is the bottom of the magazine door and what it looks like when the elevator is in the down position. When the last missile was raised to the top, its launcher was held down by these bolts on all sides to give it a sturdy firing platform. Here we have the elevator floor and the vault below it. Water still collects down here and needs to be pumped out periodically. There are two areas the elevator can be controlled from. One is directly on the elevator platform and allows you to make it go up, down, and come to a full stop. The second set of controls is on the wall to the left of the elevator. This has the same controls as the other, but it also controls the magazine doors above. These are some of the electrical panels that fed the various systems in the magazine and worked with the communication system. This is the electrical box we saw earlier from across the room. You can now easily see the waterline. Here we have the emergency escape ladder soldiers would have used to get out of the magazine. There are still signs of just how dangerous it was to work inside of the magazine. 
We are now entering the hallway that leads to the control room inside the magazine. This is the control room for the magazine. Behind where the soldiers would have sat is another emergency escape ladder leading to the launch pad above. We'll go ahead and head back out of this magazine and make our way over to the next one. We're now entering the second magazine. This one was found in better shape than the last one and shows the elevator in the up position with the doors down. The elevator is powered by a single hydraulic piston and guided on tracks located at both ends. The majority of the wiring inside the magazine is still in place. You can also see the water didn't get as high in this magazine as the other one. These are the motors that power the hydraulic pumps to raise and lower the magazine's elevator. The wiring in this electrical box is in remarkable condition. From here you can really get a sense of just how big the magazine is. A lot of the painted signs are still visible thanks to the water level staying so low in this magazine. Okay, let's head over to one more magazine that hasn't been restored to show you the condition that they were found in when the water was drained. I got the feeling like I was back in Chernobyl while I was exploring this magazine. Flooded stairwell, check. Musty air, check. Knowing there was once nuclear material in the same area where I am walking through now, check. There's something about decay that I just love to see and document.
All right, it's time for me to head out of this Cold War relic. I'd like to say thank you to the Civil Air Patrol and Maryland Wing Commander Colonel Brenda Reed and Chief Master Sergeant Tom Reed for inviting me out to take a tour of this amazing facility. If you're interested in taking a tour of Nike Missile Site BA-79, it is open to the public the fourth Sunday of each month, May through October from 1 to 4 p.m. The tours are free, but all donations go towards helping the all-volunteer staff preserve this amazing piece of American history. Thanks for joining me on this journey through time. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. Until next time, this is Evan signing off from the Nike Missile Site BA-79. See you later.